I know. I didn't even know. <laughs> Okay, well, good morning for those who are here on Bookmarks and Breadsticks. I am Kim, and I am joined by Margaret. Margaret, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Hello, Kim's audience. I'm Margaret Pinard. I've got a channel at my name, Margaret Pinard, and I'm a booktuber slash author tuber. Um, I'm most into historical fiction, nonfiction, and I guess nature writing. I don't know. We'll we'll see what 2021 brings, but that's the the flavor so far. And I met Kim, I think, on one of her other panels with Amrita and Rosie and that crowd. Oh, these from, female ones. Yes, very excited to have you know watched the last one and caught up and have a book in common that we wanted to jump in on together. I know it is lovely to have you. I have honestly had this book on my shelf since I think 2018. So I'm like very, very glad that oh, I good. got this. Nice. Yeah, but... I would say, so for those who don't know, Sour Heart is by Jenny Zhang, came out in 2017. It's 301 pages plus acknowledgments at the end. I actually listened to it as an audiobook and it comes in at 10 hours long. So first question, how did you, I want to say consume, it sounds like a weird way, but did, did you read it physically? Did you e-read it? Um, how did you read the book? I read it as a hardcover from the library. So I tried to time it. It's hard to time holds, but this one was not the highest priority at the library. So I was able to time it so that I could read it during the month that we were reading it. Unfortunately, I returned it before I left that house and now I'm with my parents. And so I don't have a copy to hold up, but yeah, I read the hardcover. Hey, supporting your local library is a good thing. Yeah. I actually listened to it, um, which was an experience in itself. Um, so about the book, this is debut fiction and is actually a group of short stories about the Chinese American experience or Chinese American immigrants and Chinese American children or children of Chinese American immigrants. Um, I, I have questions, but in general, um, first off, I guess this shows how unprepared I was or how long I've had the book. I didn't know it was short stories at first, but when I was listening to it, there's actually three different narrators um, that will bounce back and forth when I was reading, when I'm listening to it. So I actually found it a little hard to understand what was going on at certain points, but I guess high level, um, what did you think? I would also would love like your author, you're, you're an author book tuber as well. I would love your perspective on this book. Well, okay. So, there's general impressions as a reader, but then there's also what you just pointed out, three narrators intrigues me. So I'm gonna tag onto that first. Um, sure. So the the short stories are linked. They're sort of loosely linked with similar, sorry, the same characters, but not um, much overlap, I would say. And I did not do the pencil in hand, visor on my head, sort of working, um, you know, drafting who's who and who's in whose life. I just sort of, read through it and let it flow and was like, oh, I recognize that name or, oh, I recognize that experience. It must be the same kid in fifth grade, da, 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 da. So um, I don't know if there, I thought there were more than three narrators in terms of chapters, but maybe they only went with three for the audio experience and gave them different voices, but that was interesting. So I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Did you keep close track of, because of the I, narrator choice? Or? I didn't, I didn't at first. And at some some chapters, to your point, it's definitely in the same universe, the same neighborhood. Sometimes it felt like it, but sometimes I would have to sit there and I would pause the audiobook and go get the book. And I still at times had not no idea what was going on, but I was like, "Wait, are these friends? Is this the same girl from that chapter over there?" And I I like yeah. I like authors that play in the same universe. I grew up reading Sarah Dess and young adult books, and those are all all those girls exist in the same universe. So. Usually I like the Easter egg. And in this one, I actually found it very difficult. And to your mm. point, I think there were only three narrators just because it's an Audible book. Um, it's actually one of like the last books I ever bought on Audible because now I use Scribd. Um, so I was like, this is interesting. Yes, I've made the transition. I'm actually, um, my goal this year was to get completely off of Amazon for all book related things. And I'm almost 100% off of it in general, side tangent. There were only a couple things I bought when I moved, but in general, like I'm trying to, be completely gone. Use bookshop.org, everybody. Yeah. Um, I All think right. if, if I had read the book, I think I would have had a different experience with this book. 
So like from a reader, did I like this book and the stories? I did. I liked learning about these different immigrant experiences and what it, because I'm Persian American. I'm a daughter of an immigrant. So I wanted to see if any of this resonated in some ways. In some ways it does. In some ways it really doesn't. But I almost wonder if I had picked up the book and like sat with it, would I have understand understood the world? I actually don't know. Mm -hmm. I felt like it was a pretty recognizable world setting for me. Um, basically it's set in New York city and Brooklyn, but there's also little adventures and sidebars into North Carolina and, uh, Long Island and China. And you sort of for time, um, but mostly sort of 20 years ago, Brooklyn. And so I, I recognize a lot of those like rites of passage. So that was familiar. I think when we read something, um, we're looking for a little bit of the familiar to ground us. So I think there was enough of that for me. Um, the, I think first two chapters were kind of like, whoo, like there was a little less air in my lungs in terms of what did I just dive into? Because they're like grab you right away in terms of like kids experiencing things that are not what maybe you remember about your childhood <laughs> or that I do. Yeah. Um, and so I, I, I was like set up like to expect things that were pretty heavy. And then it just sort of went like this throughout and it was sort of woven things. Um, yeah. Like the, it's mostly childhood stories in grade school. And yes. I think the author is very brave to put a lot of these things out there because it's like the gross stuff that you did during pu puberty that stood out to me the most. That was like part of the shocker at the beginning um, and was just really real. I One of the notes I took was pervasive corporeality. I'm probably like, why are you hitting me with these silly words? <laughs> but by that, yeah. it was like the scratching of the legs thing. And then like the, the girls like, poking each other in the nether parts in the in the vagina basically and so I was like wow this is what are we getting into here and um this I think is really intent intentional in terms of getting people into the bodies of people who are uncomfortable in their environments and trying to figure out how they belong and that sort of thing so that was like the most um standout thing to me about the children's experience in New York so right off the bat. <laughs> yeah, I actually, I'll admit, um, I must have picked up this book and put it down at some point because I recognized the first chapter um, because of the horrors of the bathroom and like going across the street to the convenience store. Now, I never experienced that. Um, I'm middle class, because um, of the horrors of white passing person. But oh my gosh, the fear of like, oh, if you have to take a shit, you're going across the street. Like oh, all of these yeah. kind, like it's gross, but like as a, as a kid, I was, I had a really like weak stomach. So my mm. mom was always concerned anytime she brought me anywhere. Like we knew where every bathroom was and like every Toys R Us or Barnes and Nobles. Like, so I read that first chapter and I was like, oh my God, what am I getting myself into? And I think I wrote to you in Voxer, for me, this was challenging. It was challenging to read this book, but I think it's a testament to your point to the writer because it's so in your face. There is no sugarcoating this. There is no all American dream. They're like, no, the American dream is a slap in the face. And here's what you're going to really see. And the scratching of the legs too, like makes my skin crawl. Um, I have a gluten sensitivity. And when I moved, I accidentally glutened myself. So I had hives like on my legs. And I was just like, oh, this poor child. And that's how probably this child's like manifesting her stress. And I just felt so bad. But I kept reading. But at points, I was sometimes I was just like really like, okay, all right, this is not like nothing. I have not read anything like it, but it's it's striking. Like it makes me want to read more from her. But I'm not sure if I like. Did I adore this book? No. But I'm glad I read it. Does that make any yeah. sense? Yeah, yeah. It's 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 not sanitized. And so we're, we're getting into things that maybe we do have in our own lives in different ways, but don't want to talk about because you just don't talk about these things in polite society. And like I said, that's really courageous the author to put out there and our soul kind of thing. Cause obviously I think it's going to be a lot of family stories or family legend wrapped up into this. I did like the, um, 
jog back to China and the grandparents. It was sort of strange how they introduced the grandmother in New York and how she was so strange and how she was like lying about things constantly. And then they went back to the backstory and like the revolution and like the stress and the bullying and the the brother that was a little off and the people they had to take care of. And I really liked that. And I will, you know, say as well that that's probably more what a white person would like because it's in the past and it's history and we it feels like more... Yeah safe you know so it was nice of her to have both of those things and go okay here it is now you know like like think about the whole picture rather than just the, the piece that is okay because it's far away you know i thought that was good yeah i definitely agree the stories about the revolution were like it was the backstory i think i wanted in like the traditional full narrative fiction i love a backstory on a character and i was like oh okay but it's even the backstory is like people like shaving their heads and like just kids being that not, I don't think mean like yeah. it was just crazy they're like oh we just didn't have we didn't go to school let's all just be in harass and like I was just like holy holy crap yeah yeah roam around and for get on trains for trains for free because you're educating yourselves in, in your own country that was interesting and then like but the bullying we had two instances of bullying we had modern and we had 1960s and like what they did to the teacher like leaving her up against a tree and then they have the 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 girl who's untouchable and like so cruel in the modern context with the barbed wire and it's just like yeah okay i see the parallel and it's with us still kind of thing yeah it's crazy i mean i thankfully was never part of that kind of world of bullying i was maybe called a dork or something but it striking is the word I keep thinking of. Like to your point, like I feel like my lungs, like I was just like clenched in the chest. Like this book made me nervous. I don't know if that's the right word, but the whole time I felt like I was holding my breath. The story that I enjoy, I think the most, um, and again, I'm so bad at these names in the universe. It was, I'm, I, I apologize to the author for that, but um, when they, the mom and dad take their daughter and they try to drive on the casino bus to get paid. And then they're coming back and yeah. just the things you're trying to do to make a quick dollar and how it ends up, you end up spending your money on like a $15 bottle of water kind of scenario. And I, I feel that way every time I go through JFK and mm. it's just like, you just, all your money suddenly is gone. How did I spend $50 in the airport? I bought peanuts that kind of thing. <laughs> and the, the visual of when in the other story that, that visual is striking to me and like, the anxiety of that and the stress of that. And then the other one of they're driving in the car and he pulls over and makes his wife get out of the car. Yeah, I mean, crazy. that wife like annoyed the hell out of me. But I was just like, that's, that's, that's terrifying to me. And I don't like the moment of, I felt like I was the kid in the back of the seat. Like it felt very visceral. Cause I, I just remember being in the back seat. I'm one of three, but um, my dad always driving, my mom on the right, and I was the only child. Like I had issues sleeping in the car. Like my other sisters were like, "Oh, we're driving, conk out," and I would just sit there silently listening to adult conversations because, yeah, was, at the time there was like you know Game Boy Advances eventually came out and Walkmans eventually came out. But when you're young and they don't think you notice, and then you're just sitting there observing this universe you don't understand. I don't. I'm all over the place, but it, it's. It's like, I like that they're short stories. It's almost like scenes in a movie. Mm. But I'm not sure if short stories are my forte, per se. Oh, yeah. Not mine at all. What I uh, remember about this, and I want to uh, talk a little bit about structure and what I think what yes. I think about this one as a reader. So what I remember, because it's now like a month since I've read it, what I remember is more like visuals of the car sinking in the river and yes. you know like there's like flashes of things that are just so horrifying that they stay like they make a make a, an after image on your brain and like the the two parents huddled around the daughter scratching her legs and like the bullying with the barbed wire and so there's like those those really um harsh scenes that have stayed with me um but in terms of re the reading experience it was like shocker shocker at the beginning and the voice was, I think I, when I wrote to you at the beginning, it was like, this is so voicey, which by which I mean like 
the person who comes in could not be mistaken for another narrator. It felt very like in your face, sort of like, I'm in a girl gang. What do you do about it, bitch? Like, <laughs> there's like this really tough um, persona that was coming off at the beginning. And when we switched to other people and went to other places and times, it sort of ebbed and flowed. But that harsh beginning sort of um, petered out and came into like explanations, backstories. And the last chapter or two, I think maybe just the last chapter or story, um, it was much more like, I don't want to say an apologia, but it was much softer and like accepting and sort of making peace with. And I thought, is that, is that how we're supposed to end and feel? Cause it, it feels much better by the end to me. Yeah. But I don't know what that says like commentary wise in terms of like the experience and where we are now. What, what do you, what were your thoughts about the structure? That is, I'm so glad that you mentioned it because I'm very driven by pacing and I I read and review scripts like screenplays so part of me was like looking for cadence or looking for a theme or a structure and by the end of it it almost felt like the narrator was older mm -hmm. and having more clarity but at the same time it's not it's like a middle school grade school kind of age but there felt like there was some kind of sage wisdom or to your point coming to peace at it and I I I, I maybe that was the point of like I sat there and I was like oh thank gosh a little bit of relief because it is it was like so much yeah I feel like I'm not articulate this morning or afternoon apologies but I felt that crescendo and then that like relax at the end that like exit chapter and I almost want more chapters like the end of the book or stories like the end of the book but maybe that's the point is Jenny is the author Jenny Zhang is trying to say like, no, you need to see the good, the bad and the ugly to really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. um, but I did find that sometimes it felt unbalanced, like super intense, very visceral moments. And then I only got my reprieve at the last chapter. Yeah. But I don't know if that's, I, I don't know the, the thought process behind writing short stories and how you put them together. Do you call this an anthology? They call this debut fiction on the front cover. So I'm not quite sure how I'm supposed to interpret that. Um, I, think, I think anthology means you have it from different authors. So it's a collection of short stories, but I don't think it would be called an anthology. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. I agree with you that I have flashes and like almost movie scenes. This would be like beautiful to, to shoot. I think this would be great storytelling visually. Like I think of that family on that one mattress and then all of the mattresses of the families, yeah. which yeah. that was the nice, like, not meat cute, like Easter egg where I was like, Oh yeah. You're complaining about that girl from chapter one. I right. Right. <laughs> but that was, I feel bad saying that was like my only, that was what validated my hunch that these universes were connected. Well, a lot of the time I was like, I think, I think this is the person I think maybe. Um, yeah. The girl, the friend, the Chinese friend from a different family who was really annoying and was like going around and tell, like kept bugging her. Um, that was like one of the families. Like, I think, I think there's probably like, I don't know, there's like five mattresses, right? So yeah, we get all five families. I don't feel like it was neat, but it was just sort of like woven together. And I was, I was okay with that. I was like, I'm not, I don't want to do the work to figure out like who's who in exactly every story. So I just sort of like, as I said, let it go. Um, yeah. Have you read other works by Chinese or Chinese American authors? This was one of the first for me. Um, I'm thinking because I, I I'm, <laughs> this is why I have my story grab open. <laughs> uh, this month, no. No, I, so my, my recent reading that I can like say that I came out with an adult appreciation. Um, I don't think so. Not that I recognize as specifically Chinese experience or Chinese American experience. So I, what I'm comparing it to in my mind and it's vastly different, but it also talks about Asian immigrant experience is last fall. I read, um, the last, ugh, Last story of Mina Lee. No, so she's a Korean American, and I okay. read Sandy Golston, um, who also has a booktube channel and an author tube portion. And we talked a lot um, 
about this, but the funny thing is the difference in style is that she is um, coming at the experience in a much more, I'm trying to like think of a movie that I can compare it to. So if, if Sour Heart, and we need to go over the senses and the sourness, because that's a great point too. Sour Heart is more like Dirty Pretty Things. Did you watch that movie? With Audrey Totu about like the black market for organs and like France. Yes, and all yeah, that stuff. it's been a minute, but I it definitely coming right. back to me in pieces. Right. So that like like shocker underbelly type of movie, and the last I'm gonna get the thing right. Let me let me look it up. Um, the last story of Muna Lee. Okay, and it's by Nancy Juyun Kim. And that one is more like tilted toward history. So not history, mystery. So it's uh, okay. the 80s and now. And the mystery is how her mother died because she suspects that it was foul play. And she sort of unwraps all these relationships that she didn't know about from her estranged mother. mother. And it's sort of like a mystery because you're trying to find out. But then you also get flashbacks about her mother's life. And it's much more like earnest immigrant I'm trying to find like a movie comparison for this. It's not ragtime, but it doesn't show you all like the, the gross stuff, you know, like the really, yeah. what really imprints on you as a kid growing up in that situation. So those are the two that I'm comparing in my mind, the Chinese and the Korean experience, because they're just like reading recent, you know? Yeah. I yeah. spend a lot of this month. I have, I've collected a lot more diverse authors to read. Um, I have a whole, um, booktube made me buy them video coming out and like, yeah. <laughs> but I have, um, Vietnamese American. I have, I find that I've read more Japanese Americans. I don't know if that's because I grew up watching anime. So I'm, to me, it's an easier transition. Um, so I try to read diversely, but this is definitely the first Chinese American that I remember reading, let's say in the past three years. Right. And it makes me very like it, it just hints on it to your point at the end of the book or when we visit the story of the grandma how something some kinds of trauma are carried through generations or like the bullying to the bullying and now i i want to know more i just have to not be afraid of it because to me it is challenge it was challenging and i'm just like okay yeah. um and i i'm excited i admit that when i bought it i bought it at strand bookstore in new york city of all places i saw sour heart and saw the grapes and yeah. i for some reason was thinking more food would be involved because obviously that's my thing that's my channel yeah. Um, but they really don't talk about it too much other than the dynamic oh, right. of wanting to eat like ham and cheese sandwiches and juicy juices with, in one of the stories. And I remember my dad, when he came, my dad came to America when he was 19, but he was not hugely into American things, American cuisine. But as he got older in life, like one of his favorite, like he was a staunch, like Coke versus Pepsi. He was a Coke man. Or if he was a Burger King versus McDonald's, he was a Burger King man. Um, but as a, as like a, he would be a college per, He was in college when he first came to America. He was not really into it. But as a, as a middle school child, I could see why you would desperately want right. American food and feel normal. Yeah. And like, I mean, I grew up taking lunch to school with me, like wrapped in tin foil, and all I wanted were the hot lunches when you could right. buy like the square yeah. piece the of gross pizza. pepperoni pizza. Yes. <laughs> There's so in, much yeah. fear of missing out on that. Like as the a Lunchables. Kid. Yeah. Even oh my gosh. Gross. Yes. Yeah. The Capri yeah, so, the Lunchables. Yeah. When I, so when I was thinking about this a little this morning, I was thinking it's probably such a gut wrenching narrative because it's talking about puberty and all these things that we were so nervous about as kids, which is a universal experience. But because the things that put them apart were, primarily racialized like your hair or development timeline or what was in your lunchbox or um you know whether you went home to an empty house or not those kind of things because of poverty like some of them are universal but some of them are so specifically racialized as like the reason that they're picked on and so that's just interesting to see on our on our side like it's hard for me to remember back to middle grade and think, well, I know who is in my class. We're mostly white growing up in this community in California. Yeah. And like thinking back to people's experience, what, um, 
Janae uh, Coffee and Copyrights when when I was talking about some of the thinking I was doing like back in February, March about, yeah, there was one African-American kid throughout grade school and high school, and then there were two. And it's like, they were known for certain things, but were we like putting them on them? Like how much of that was pressure and how much of that was expectation or their family dynamic? And it's just sort of like a, it's a good thing to think about as an adult because we're influencing the system that we're reproducing now with policy choices and all this kind of stuff. So big yeah. tangent, but yeah. <laughs> No, definitely relevant though, because I think back to, I grew up on Long Island. I grew up in a very white, upper middle class public school system. And to your point, when I look back, I would have to look in my yearbook. Was there diversity? Yes. But was it probably like 70 to 80% predominantly white or like me white passing? Yeah. Um, and it's a good question of how much we, our memory, like memories, do we impress on other people? And even like generation, like my younger sister, three years younger than me, and her high school and middle school upbringing was still vastly different. There was still much more diversity than when I went through it. And I look back now, I think of like the family, the high school reunion we went to, which was like two years ago now, pre-pandemic. And I'm like, wow, there's this bunch of white, rich Long Island kids, or yeah, they yeah. felt rich. I did. It's interesting. I was not poverty, not at all the same experience, but I do remember moments feeling otherness that the book really touches on. Um, and I referenced it before when we, before we went live, um, I was in sixth grade when 9-11 happened and my dad had, was a Muslim man and lived in America for 30 plus years, but he always has that, he always had that thick Iranian Arabic accent. Mm -hmm. um, and that was the first time I experienced otherness in the sixth grade and having people like, they look at your last name differently or they suddenly like, well, you don't look like, the people we see on TV or like the women with the hijabs. And I'm like, right. I was born here. Yeah. And I was, we were all my sisters and I we were raised more in the vein of my mother as Roman Catholic, white passing. Um, but that was the first time I experienced otherness. And I think that was part of the visceral reaction I had from the book is like, I remember otherness, but not to the intensity of this, not at all. Just, I don't want anyone to think I'm like, this was powerful, but I also related to that weird feeling. And I still think I even feel it now as an adult. Um, I know I'm white passing, but I also know that I get pulled over at the airport sometimes. It's gotten better as 9-11 has become more part of the distant past, near distant past, excuse me. But I remember getting pulled out of lines all the time just for my last name. Mm -hmm. and you're like, hello, hello, hi. Yeah, yeah. Here's my, here's my single razor blade razor. Would you like to take that? Right. There's actually, um, I don't know if you've heard the, the difference between white passing and white presenting in terms of the African-American community, at least what I've heard from Ooh, tell me. booktubers is white passing is more like you're trying to access the benefits that are given to white people because you can be assumed to be white, but white presenting is like people just assume you're white upon seeing you. So one is more intentional and sort of like cunning and one is more like how you just look um, compared to the regular population because people on social media have called out like certain actors, actresses for being a passing. It's like, there's a difference with passing like an intentional move to improve your situation in certain ways, but white presenting is like anyone looking at you would assume X. So just- Wow, that's actually be. really, that's really interesting. Cause I feel like I'm definitely then was raised as white presenting and mm -hmm. Or I'm not, I'm not sure which one I would fall into because when I've asked my parents before, I don't, I can't fluently really read Farsi and I can't fluently speak it. Um, but when I've asked my parents and I, I, no judgment to them, but at the time they said we raised it for your protection. My dad came to America like the Shah, the fall of the Shah. There were reasons they did and made their choices. And I don't, I don't um, regret that at all. But then as I learn more about my heritage, I feel like I, it's almost, I'm not trying to do white passing. It's almost like the reverse. Like, I wish the right. Persian community or would take me in more. Right. Yeah. And right. I found a great community of um, Persian Americans. Um, all uh, we're in a Persian bookstagram group. And I'm like, I'm so desperate for them to accept me. It, it's just a weird, like, reverse of it, I guess. Because right. I, right. I never. Well, it's incentives, right? Yeah. At the time when they moved in, it was it was the smarter move or it was perceived to be the smarter move to like fit in and what's it called 
or my dad will be very disappointed. I forgot this this word. Sociolo sociology, like when you uh, assimilate. 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 Thank you. <laughs> I got it. Um, but then as a kid, you realize how much was lost when that choice was made. And you're like, well, there's trade-offs. Like I had this upbringing and these privileges perhaps, but then I really want to know what I came from and be able to engage with people on a you know knowledgeable level of what my background is. And so, yeah, they it feels, right back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's, I don't know what the reverse is called, but that's how I felt. That's how I feel every time I check. I almost have guilt associated with, I check a box when it's like, well, what is your race? Two or more races. I am considered Persian American. I can claim minority uh, because it is, but right. because I'm so white presenting, I almost feel like people are, I project a fear that people think I'm trying to take advantage of a system. And I don't mean to, I genuinely am just trying to gather my heritage, especially because I just lost my dad in January. So now I'm like desperate for anyone to come find me. So if I check the box and it gets me to a community I want to be a part of, yeah. it, it's that's what I'm trying to do. Um, but it's yeah. like, like you can be a minority business owner. You can be a woman, like a woman business owner, all of those kinds of things. Right. This is such, I took us on such a little journey off the kind of American <laughs> story, true, but yeah, I, it goes back to the idea of otherness and how it feels. I think some of the stories even touched on it. Like she needs to learn to speak English. And it's like, I've been here the whole time. I know how to speak English. Right. Um, and just what that, I couldn't even imagine what that's like, or just, um, I'm not, I'm not, not intelligent. I'm just poor. And it's just, well, oh, this is not a Hallmark movie read. For, for, for everyone watching, but it's a powerful read. Yeah. Um, Hi, Amy. <laughs> I see Amy put a comment in there. Hi. Yeah. Um, I have a note I wrote down that you wanted to talk about sour. Yes. Go for um, it. Yeah, so that is yeah. one of the opening things. The opening story is a girl who really likes sour uh, foods and tastes and flavors. And she shares that with her mother and it's sort of like their little secret that they find things that are sour and enjoy that together. Um, but she loses it. You find out later as she gets older and then she like sort of gets used to sweet things. And I think that's definitely like a, a tracker or a little indicator signifier, whatever, uh, of like her cultural assimilation because like, I think sour things is a very non American flavor. If you yes. look at our American cuisine, it's, it's very bland. So um, like sour plums and things like that are specifically Asian flavors. And so um, I liked that it was like a secret that she could have with her mother and they would search out things. And when the vendor thought he was selling them on something that was so sweet and they're like, oh, not for me because it's not sour enough. And then they walked off. Like there's just these little moments that are, uh, for one of a better term, like uh, inside jokes that are the things that families share together with their shared history. And then to sort of lose that later or have to deny it to the mother. I, I can't remember if there is an instance of that, but if you remember that, like, yeah, it might play out or it might not match up exactly, but I liked that about it. You I did know. too. Um, you're right. When I think of Americans, I think of sugar, processed sugar. We could go on a whole tangent about food, food and stuff, but I won't, I'll bring it back over here. But my dad loved sour stuff mm. like my dad could just pop a lime and like suck the juice out of it um pomegranates? But not... what Pom pomegranates yes yeah lots of pomegranates um i still like pomegranates but i i didn't grow up with sour but now as i get older i feel like i'm seeking sour and now i'm like oh like is this a thing is this like a, a flavor that's passed down in like my blood my dna and i don't even know um, so I, I did relate to that. I do prefer sour grapes to this day, though, over sweet grapes. Mm. Um, sorry, I'm very distracted by someone who's approaching my front door. Oh. Hello. Sorry. Home ownership and not being on the 23rd floor of an apartment. You're like, hi. Hello, stranger. <laughs> they don't yeah. mean anything. You're just like, oh, people. I people watch now. I'm sorry, everybody. I'll bring that back in. Um, sorry. Oh my gosh. So when did this take, this took, did you, when you, <laughs> when you read the scene about putting that car in the river, did you like, did you, I did not understand the logic of that. Like we got to get rid of the car. And I'm like, 
you're gonna sink it in the Hudson? <laughs> yeah, what? I didn't. I didn't really either. It was that was one of the ones I read early before I like put it down and picked it back up. So I don't recall exactly why. Um, what I remember is that the girl was trying to save something from it, and so she dove back in, and it was like sewage in the water. And it was really gross and like a traumatic. Uh, but I don't re I don't remember the reasoning. But I don't. I think the kid maybe didn't know the real reasoning either. Like, why would someone do that? Do you remember why? Was it the payments or? No, it had something to do with chain. Well, I think for the girl, she um, feared change. And the car suddenly meant something to her at the very last minute. Um, and so, you know, and confession, like this is me. Like sometimes I don't think I understood these stories or what they were supposed to mean. And I, I feel really guilty that I didn't. Well, I, I was, I forgot to ask you this beforehand, but hopefully it's okay. So one of the things I was uh, thinking about is how much we get these books that are diverse books. Because there's been a few videos out that are asking people, why are you reading diverse books on purpose for BookTube if, like, you're not getting into the real experiences of the people writing these books in real life? Like, real life, not BookTube. And, like, sort of keep it. Like, if you're, that's all you're going to do, then, like, don't, don't bother me with this shit. <laughs> And I was trying to grapple with that in terms of my own experience. And like, there's, there's educating yourself, which they pointed out is step one. And then there's like the next steps that they expect people to take and they don't see. And so on one hand, I think of, well, you don't see because everyone has their own process and I'm fine with like people doing self care and trying to like get mm -hmm. to there on their own. But on the other hand, it's totally valid that if you don't see media covering things that are important to Asian American communities, for example, then you should step up because the whole point of reading diverse books to me is to empathize more with that community and understand where they're coming from and advocate and issues that are touching lives. Um, in this community. And so, um, what was I going to bring this back around to? I just lost my thought. <laughs> the idea of diverse reading and the reasoning, the why. Behind the getting, it, okay, so getting the point of the books. So as a reader, as an extensive reader, as we are, uh, I feel like we feel bad if we don't get the point or feel like we totally get the theme or like the, you know, not the Easter eggs, but like the overall arching lesson, if you will. And I think that's okay. Like if we read more, we'll get more of the points. And you know, that's, that's part of the discomfort of learning is that you're not gonna understand everything at the beginning. And I used to really hate that and now I'm getting better at it. So yeah, like I don't understand everything and the best I can do is to talk about it with people and be embarrassed that I didn't get it and then get over exactly. it. Like, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm sure people who maybe will start reading Persian American authors are not going to pick up on some of the more poignant moments that I will. Um, and to your point, I think the reason I keep calling the book challenging is because it did put me out of my comfort zone. Right. And I'm sure there's lots of nuances I'm missing. Um, I was trying to look up some interviews with Jenny before we started mm -hmm. and it makes me want to keep reading. I think to your point, that's also a reason I got rid of like review star systems to each their own. But what I've also seen, um, especially Jesse over at um, Bowtie, Books and Bowties, Bowties and Books, yeah. I'm getting her channel backwards. Um, yeah. She often brings up the point that, especially when white readers read, let's say, horror from a, a BIPOC voice, they rate them lowly, but lower because they're looking at it through a white lens and like white conventions. Right. So, to your point, I don't want to rate a book like this because I think there's new other side. There we go. I think there's nuances that I'm missing out on and I'll take the star system away because some people won't read anything below a three star. Yeah. I encourage everyone watching, like read this book. It's challenging. I honestly think maybe read it versus listen to it. Cause I think that's part of where my biggest struggle came from. But to your going back to our earlier conversation, I have cinematic moments. I'm still thinking about this book and I finished it two weeks ago and it's, even before I got on, my husband's like, so what book are you talking about? I was like, this one. And she's like, he's like, so what's it about? And I'm like, I don't <laughs> know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm reading Amy's note too. 
Well, yeah, Amy's notes great. So feel free to read it. just through the that I pulled to see if there was anything I wanted to like push up here in our discussion. I think it's a good point in the comments, um, which I think I can make this show. Ta da! Okay. Yeah. Give me learning as I go. I do think, and I agree with Amy, that the more we read diversely, the more we can pick up things in the real world. And I mean, also, I have to like learn how to go back out into the real world now that, well, at least in the US of this good portion of us that are vaccinated. And now the CDC has said, if you have your vax, if you've been vaccinated and gotten both doses, you can take your masks off. I have to learn how to do all that again. Very, like, I don't know how I feel about seeing faces again. <laughs> it comes back. Story. It comes back. Like I was, I was having that weird sort of like bubbles in my gut feeling when I would go somewhere with a mask and pick up food to, for takeout. Cause I was like, I'm inside. Like, there's people inside like this is danger, danger. <laughs> so, but yesterday I've had, I've had my second shot. I think I still like have three days until like I'm cured or whatever the, the recommendation is. It's like but incubation or something. Yeah. I was outside and we were looking at a garden event with my family yesterday. And um, it, was, it was sort of like passing by people because there's a lot of people there, but it was masks at your discretion. And I felt, pretty comfortable being outside and like moving and you know not staying with people so it it evolves back very quickly to like normal so we'll see like shaking hands with strangers no <laughs> getting in an elevator without masks no but you know yeah uh, I, I'm so glad that like I agree I'm like feeling it out we've been in Lowe's a couple times because we're we're fixing little things in the new home right. Lowe's wearing a mask too many people touching things I went around to Barnes and Nobles without a mask on, but that's also because Barnes and Nobles is not like knocking down the door with tons of people in it. Yeah. And but if I saw someone and I was gonna like interact, I like walked the other way. I was like, I don't want to breathe on you yeah. going around. Yeah. <laughs> um, but to your point, public transportation, elevators. I would love to never have to shake someone's hand because I also feel like as a woman, it's always like firm grip, but not too firm a grip because you don't want to come off as intimidating and blah blah. blah you know, right? Just, hey. How's it going? Just like, I'm good with the wave. Okay. I, I am too. And I'm a hugger. Through. So like, at least my inner circle, it like knows me and they'll be like, yes, hug. But I've yeah. had to like ask friends too. I'm like, do we still hug? And they're like, yes, for you, Kim, we still hug. But like, yeah. Extended yeah. family? Don't have to hug anymore. Like, it's pretty right. cool. Yeah. All right. I'm going to throw a quote at you. This is that Ooh, sound. Go for it. Okay. So it's kind of a long paragraph. It's on page 23. So it's early in the book and it gives you a good, I think, feel for the questions that the text is asking. Um, home, I guess, nowhere. They're headed nowhere. Their lives are going nowhere. Oh yeah, I said, even as something soured inside me and not in the delicious way, like it always did whenever my dad talked like that, as if he was so sure. Didn't it bother him that he was teaching his students poetry when he was certain it wouldn't make a difference in how their lives turned out? Didn't it bother him to be so sure that it was futile to even try? And what about us? What standards did we have? Weren't our fates sealed as well? What was I ever going to become? What stopped other people from looking at us and pitying us? How we didn't see the pointlessness in working so many jobs, moving from one shit place to another and scrimping on pennies. How we couldn't face the reality of our situation. That none of this is leading up to anywhere that was any different from where we had just been. So this is like a middle school child asking themselves like the bigger questions about why did we leave where we were? Why are we here now? Like, why don't we fit in anywhere? And how is this not all pointless? Like questioning the authority as she's growing up. And I thought that was a really, um, I, good is not a, is not a good word, but I really well, like yeah. that. That's one of my highlighted quotes. Yeah. It's really insightful. Uh, when, when I, oh, that one hits me deep um, as a child of an immigrant. I remember that. I, I remember feeling that. I still feel it sometimes. I was talking to someone recently and there's such a pressure for children of immigrants to succeed, to be very successful, to do anything. Because you think about all the shit your parents sacrificed for you. Uh, my dad came over and had to get a new degree in engineering and he started by driving UPS trucks. He was a delivery guy. And then worked his way all the way up that chain. And I have such pride in it. but the, And such a 
big tenacity. I've been also told I have grit, something very like inherent. And I think children of immigrants have it mm -hmm. um, without realizing it's part of our conditioning. Yeah, yeah. So that's that quote, I feel it for every time I've been let go from a job or when I lost one of my first jobs out of college and had to move home to live with my parents again and then was working three part-time jobs. I think my dad was just like, he would be so, he, he, his, what he would say out loud was, I am worried about you because you're working till 2 a.m. But I think what his horror was, was holy shit, did everything we do, was it all pointless? And I would be like, don't worry, it's fine, it's fine. Um, and yeah, this is the choices you gave and this is what I'm taking advantage of. Yeah. I was like, don't worry. I, I used to, at that point in my life, I was like in my early twenties and it was Dunkin' Donuts, 5.00 AM to 7.00 AM. Get on a train, get changed in the train bathroom, take a train in New York city, work an unpaid internship, come home and then work at a movie theater and work like the overnight shift as a supervisor. And it drove him insane. So that futility of that quote and the power and the tragedy behind that quote I feel it. It's like every defeat or every setback just feels a hundred times worse. And I don't, I, I don't know if like, uh, like I feel such angst talking to you about it, but I don't know if I'm conveying it the most in the most eloquent way, but that, that quote is so symbolic. I think of a lot of the pressure that kids carry. Mm. Um, like I yeah. think I, I joke about it now. And when I was, you know, later in life, but I used to think my dad, I wanted, I originally got into school to be a veterinarian and it was a doctor, tangent, you know, adjacent doctor, but he was like, she's going to be a doctor. She's going to make a ton of money. Um, but I used to joke that he wanted me to marry like a Persian, you know, another Persian doctor and that we would live an hour away at max, like live down the street from him and have his right. whole life. Right. I married a nice Irish man. I married Dan. He's American. Um, I am not a veterinarian. I work in ice cream. Um, like, I think my whole twenties, my dad was holding his breath being like, what is she doing? Yeah. Um, by the, towards the end, like I've, I, we've both gotten our MBAs. I now have a house. My dad didn't live to see the house, but he saw pictures when we were buying it in November. Mm -hmm. So I think like towards the end of it, he knew I was going to be just fine. Like, and I remember hearing that at my wedding, like you're going to be okay. And you're going to take care of your mother. And I knew that all along, but like the pressure that quote, like I should like, I should make every, every person who doesn't understand what it's like to be the child of an immigrant needs to like kind of read that quote. Yeah. And the poetry part too, as a teacher, that's even more tragic. Cause I think more and more people are trying to get the arts out of schools and upbringing. And it's just like, the arts were so important to me. I mean, I went to school to get an English degree. I went to film school. Like I, I went full arts. There's, yeah. There's a couple different issues. So there's, I think the, I want to talk about the parents and children and expectations because that's yes. something I've been talking about in my family, but there's a difference thing about going from one environment to another and losing all your status basically is what that is. Like if you had, if you were a doctor in China, you came here and you know, you had to drive a delivery truck or deliver Chinese food. Um, that's a separate thing. So first, like, there's, there's kids with parents with expectations in the typical American family too. So I'll just, you know, push that out there as is something that I and my siblings may have struggled with. And I think the American individualism piece that is so vaunted and like valued in pop culture is part of, well, it's part of a lot of problems, first of all, but it also leaves me sort of sitting on the fence of like, how much do you um, uh, preserve the family unit and the expectations and the culture? And how much do you strike out on your own and do what you want to do and say, I, these are expectations are not mine. Your success is not mine. I need to walk my own road. And so mm -hmm. that isn't, that's universal. It may be a specific type of tension for a first generation, second generation family interaction but it's also universal yeah very you know? true very fair yeah yeah it's it can be a rough place <laughs> mm -hmm. amy has a um quote about that she's seen so many examples of that paragraph as well so this is yeah good a good choice good yeah. <laughs> and then um her quote in this country you can do whatever you want to do so keep working hard from her dad she, she says, I always felt like not succeeding would mean shattering his firm belief in the American dream. 
And yes, I think generation wise, like where we're at. So you said you're 31, I'm 40 this year. So there's the thing of like American dream. Aren't we, aren't we past that? Don't we know that that doesn't really exist? Like Mm -hmm. I, I just saw something I think on a, on a TikTok that was about like the American dream is just, um, what was it? Giving up everything that you want and getting nothing in return kind of thing. It was like, Oh, like, yes, but yes. Yeah. I feel, I agree with you. Like the shattering of the American dream, but also I play the millennial card and I am a true millennial. That's my age demographic. Everyone talks about the hustle mentality and the side hustle and objectively I sit back here I mean I have a side business I'm, I'm not ashamed of it I'm very proud of it but part of me sits back here I'm like the whole reason I have a side hustle is because we're not happy in our current jobs but we need current jobs to pay bills because capitalism do you not understand what you set us up to do and why a lot of us are miserable because the generation before us kind of screwed up the economy a little bit like not one all one person but like there's a lot of factors I recognize I'm not a socioeconomic specialist but I I feel that pressure all the time. And I think there's a whole generate, I don't know, I want to want to play the generation card, but like, yes, I feel you. The American dream thing is not real. And I think part of the first few chapters of this book reminds us of that. Like, well, I think I think it's a historic real thing, right? There was the possibility there. But then you had Gilded Age regulations, and you had the generation that made it and saved, and you had the New Deal, and then you had capitalism and everything sort of locked down and and turn off the faucet and close the door basically to people after a certain point or after a certain immigration level. And so now it's a scam. And so when I hear about like the American dream now, I think, well, one, it's a scam because like the hustle culture. And all that is driving us to succeed when we can't because the deck is, you know, the deck is stacked. Um, but um, I will throw in there that I now will call myself a geriatric millennial because I don't know if you saw J.D. Estrada's recent little clips. He's put them on all his platforms. He does these little things like dresses up as an old guy and like does an accent and has like a things that we remember growing up. And he's the same age as me. So <laughs> I'm like, yes. Yes, I remember that internet sound. Yes, I remember that sound. Oh, are like people who are like the safe button. What is that? And it's like it's a floppy disk. They're like, what's a floppy disk? Right. I'm like, like, floppy oh disk are floppy. Yeah. My my friends, uh, one of my best friends, his nephew got wanted like office supplies for his birthday. We'll put that aside for a sec. But he got a rotary phone, yeah. and I don't know if it even works. But I was like, does this like six year old know what a rotary phone even is? I grew up using one. Yeah, yeah. I did. And here's the funny thing. My parents have had a rotary phone since I was, you know, as a kid and it's a landline, like a true landline. Like there's no digital connection between like a handset and a, a whatever this is called receiver. Yes. <laughs> it's like a phone you pick up that is corded and then grounded. And um, pg and &E here in California, in case you don't know, is a POS. And they basically interrupted service enough times that it was unreliable so that my parents would not renew. What they're doing is trying to get people not able to rely on old technologies. So they have to upgrade. So they have to be in the new system. And I that puts no you in a whole system. So yes, the company is. So another gripe, another geriatric moment. <laughs> Amy's saying, have you, you seen how proud. kids nowadays answer the phone when they're play acting? They don't even make the receiver gesture anymore. It's they true. Do they do this, like holding the phone? <laughs> oh, this one, I like this one. The people who just talk in the speaker oh, yeah, out yes, loud yes. in public. Yeah. I mean, I must've been like five years ago. I first saw a video of a kid trying to do this to a book, like a physical book. And I was like, that's so sad. <laughs> Grow up in a real house where you have books and you can't do that. <laughs> it just killed me. Oh my gosh. <sighs> oh, do you have another quote? I'm going to say we're almost at the hour mark, but I love these yes. quotes. I could yes. talk. Okay. And this is getting back to like social, like big picture stuff. Page 270 near the end of the book. Oh, well, sort of. Uh, feng Shui. I pronounced it the way my white freshman year roommate had pronounced it when she informed me that her white Buddhist boyfriend was going to perform a Tibetan blessing on our room and clear it of bad energy. Not that I have to explain it to you, she had added, trying so hard to respect me that it became disrespectful. 
And that sort of like sat with me and I was like trying to figure out this cycle. This is one of those things that I'm not sure I get and I'm trying to understand like, okay, so there's appropriation there and then there's an attempt to like have a sop to the person who you envision is from that culture. And the effort that is made to do that is disrespectful in the narrator's voice. And so I'm kind of going, okay, what's a parallel that I can relate this to to understand it more? Did, you, did that pop out at you? And can you think of a parallel to help me here? <laughs> the only half parallel I can think of is when people say all Muslims are terrorists, or I know all Muslims aren't terrorists because I know your dad or I know you. Like, that's the only proxy I can think of. I can't think of something cultural from the Persian community that. Or any community, like, not personal. Example. Yeah. Like, I can't think of a specific one. I'm, like, waiting for Amy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> waiting for Amy to, to coach us and school us right now. Um, the only other one I can think of is, like, someone making tacos and, like, telling, like, their Mexican friend, like, oh, I'm sure you can make this better. I'm sure you know how to make these or something like that. Um, or like in the culinary world, what is the borderline between appropriation, fusion, fusion and authenticity, yeah. which was the first feasting females we kind of talked about uh, the colonization of food. Right. But yeah, that that's like. So it's it's more like it's just a blanket assumption that is hurtful. So yeah. whether it's assuming that, you know, or assuming that you don't know, it's the you are the same as all these people. And so I don't have to. What's the. um they did. They were saying this in the African American community as well. Like, there's generalizations for an entire population, but there's also the erasure of individual experience and allowing people to have individual, you know, opinions. That is really the kicker of that. Like the back, the other, the other side of that coin, maybe. Yeah, and I think uh, a reference I can actually that just popped into my mind, which I'm hoping is on the same wavelength, um, in All American Muslim Girl, which is a work of YA fiction. Um, this young girl who is white presenting like I am starts to go to a Muslim like reading group. They're reading the Quran and those girls talk about their own erasure of individuals of some of them wear hijabs because they choose to it choose to, but other people think that they're just part of this group of all women being oppressed and being forced to wear hijabs. Right. They're like I'm choosing. And then there's other girls in the reading group who are like, I'm choosing not to wear one because I find it oppressive. Right. And like they have whole fights, like these two people who firmly believe in what they're doing. That's but hard. the fact that the media is going to sit over there and go, this is this is wrong. Or in is it in France where they just banned wearing hijabs? I think so. And yeah. there's a whole group that are like, excuse me, like this is part of my culture. This is part of my religion. This is my choice. Like, so that's the only parallel that just came to mind I can think of. Mm. Uh. An example that happened to my friend was when this older white gentleman, gentleman, moved off the sidewalk to let her pass and said, I know that women in your culture don't like when men get too close to them. I mean, yeah, there's like a space between intent that is, you know, positive, but then also like assumption and erasure that's like baked into that. Because yeah. I mean, all women probably don't like women, get, men getting too close yeah, to them. Right? Like, right? Right? <laughs> Does any woman enjoy like getting catcalled or followed down the street? I don't think so. But very good. Thank you, Amy, for that example. Yeah, the automatic yeah. assumptions part. Thank you. That's a good right. phrase. And I'm probably going to take that phrase now when I start going back to the idea of reading diversely, what assumptions I carry with me into a book. And even my assumptions as a child of an immigrant, I make assumptions of that experience as well. Like I'm always connecting it to my own life because that just helps me understand but I think at times it can be off-putting to other people because I learn, but I'm a referential learner and that's how I explain my thought process. But I think some people are like, no, our experiences are not going to be exactly the same. And I'm like, oh, okay. Like I'm just trying to find common ground with you somewhere. And I make mistakes the whole time, um, all the time, not the whole time. But I think the point is just to at least be open-minded to, to your point, not generalizing not erasing the individual experience but this has been a really good conversation a very like i'm gonna go think for a while can you explain referential learner because i don't think i've heard that um maybe i made like, up the term like I, making analogies and metaphors helps you understand things is that what you mean it is and also connecting okay. to my own experiences is sometimes in conversation it can come off that i am not a good listener 
because I'm hearing you and then I'm giving you my story and my example. But what I'm really trying to do is pull a memory and the emotion associated with it. And I'm trying to genuinely find empathy with you, if not empathy, then sympathy, because I haven't experienced it. But at times it's been misconstrued that it means I'm a terrible listener and that I'm always trying to fill a silence. And I get that critique and I, I feel bad when that happens. I've learned to be quieter, uh, not on this live show, obviously. I'm a chatty, <laughs> I'm a chatty girl, but that is what helps me process. I think that's why I like reading books and stories. Like, give me your scenario and I might take your scenario and use it in another conversation and go, well, this is what I read about. It's not my experience, but like, does it sound like this? Does it? Is it close? And some people, to your point, might be like, no, my upbringing was nothing like that. I'm like, I'm sorry. I tried. <laughs> I'll try again. I'm well, sorry. Yeah. yeah. And then, like continuing to be open to someone else's definition of agency. I think that's what this book does really well. So when I was thinking about like granular experiences versus those automatic assumptions, I think what this book does really well is showcase agency and a person's learning in a certain situation in such a way that we can really okay, like in take those experiences and, and have that empathy, yeah. Hey. <laughs> Sorry, there was a child on my front lawn. I didn't know what he was doing. I get turkeys. I get turkeys at this place in the front lawn. We have wild turkeys. Yes. No one's allowed to shoot. They roam the neighborhood. It's great. <laughs> Not the bottle, the turkey, the bird. Yeah, it's fun. I mean, that's awesome. Okay, we have hit the one hour mark. Are there any other quotes you want to talk about or? <laughs> Amy's laughing at my turkeys. Uh, well, I had um, a thing about like intra-family versus intra-family. Go for it. Community. I don't want to go on too long, but basically the story. We'll make, we'll make that our last question, okay. our last topic. Yeah, the stories are woven together in such a way that the narrators are always in immigrant families, whether they're first generation or second generation or in the homeland or in America. And um, we get, mo I, I think most of the time is spent talking about family re family relations. Like the one that pops into mind is the, the friend, family friend who comes to celebrations and demands the child say whether they love their mom or their dad better and that's like terrible because she's like frightened that her mom is gonna react and have like a you know vengeful uh reaction to her answer whatever it is and so she's always trying to escape this thing so mm -hmm. it's often examining like how kids feel about their parents and not so much siblings it's basically like this parent-child relationship <laughs> that was my husband making his yeah. cameo in the background but there's also, um, and I think it's definitely secondary on purpose, the inter-family, like between immigrant families and between the kids and like the white friends or the non-Asian immigrant families, how they interact in school. So I thought that was interesting because I think um, when white folk read books, first of all, it's going to be nonfiction about anti-racism because that's like the thing of the moment. But secondly, it's going to be, oh, how does this community act, interact with ours? And so to non-center that, I think is great in a book for us to read because it's mostly about the intra-family, yes, intra-family stuff that we don't get to see, we don't get to observe, like it's probably maybe traumatic to share or it's, you know, not your business. And so to share that is one of the bigger things, I think, to to reading a, a, a book in a diverse community like this, which I really appreciated. Yeah. I'm, my mind is still whirling because it's a really good <laughs> analysis. And I'm like, yeah, but I, I don't have like a rebuttal or like a build on it because it is, it's a very complex, nuanced world. And I appreciate seeing it. Um, and I'm also just like, I, Who's, who would ever ask you who you love more, your mom or your dad? Like, yeah, there's the, yeah. I hated that. Like that whole thing was so uncomfortable. And even when, um, I think now people throw it around, they go, daddy's favorite or mommy's favorite. Like, I don't even like, I don't like that game. I'm one of three. I'm the middle child. My parents, like one's an immigrant, one's not like, I don't, ooh, I get my skin crawls even talking about it. Like, mm -hmm. And I think you just, I don't know, in my experience, like 
growing up when I was like a middle school or in high school, I had a much better relationship with my mom because I was a girl growing up and I wanted my mom. And then as I got older, I built a very strong relationship with my dad because I don't know. Um, my dad had no sons, but I took on the most son like persona in the sense of like, I went to business school and that's self described. Like if my sisters are out there watching the screen, the stream, they're probably like, no, fuck you. Like, why? Do, they? Do your sisters watch? That's an interesting question. Talk about family. Um, my younger sister does on occasion, but I, and I don't want to like ever like say something like, oh, I was totally my dad's favorite. Um, I, <laughs> the only self description we ever had was I came off the most like the sun because I went to business school. But like, that's it. Both my sisters are wonderful and are like, one's a teacher and the other works in, uh, works for, with lower income families, helping them learn how like dietetics and like helping them take care of their kids. So both my sisters are saints. I make ice cream. I am, I'm not that important. <laughs> um, but that whole scene yeah. was just like icky. I'm so sorry that like you had this very poignant, like deeper message. And I'm still at like point one of your story going, that was a really awful scene and I hated it. I think it shows how the kid felt undefended. Like they had to be an adult with their parents because they couldn't, they couldn't rely on their mother not reacting. And so the kid had to, uh, you know, avoid, avoid the situation. It was fight or flight kind of thing because they're protecting their, their protecting their, it's not a choice because she didn't want to say anything. It was just basically the peace, the peace in the family, really. Yeah. And also how miserable a lot of those marriages just sounded. It made me feel bad. Yeah. But yeah, I, I have no thoughts on that because I am not married. So I can't, I can't comment on a situation that I don't participate in. <laughs> I mean, I'm only, I'm less than a year into my marriage, but you know. Amy and I are chatting about the self-identifying self-son. Um, oh, Vietnamese names don't change their last names. That's so cool. I didn't know that. I kept my last name, um, my father's name, my surname, um, because there are no sons. So the Bizzotti name ends with me and my sisters. But my sister, my older sister took on her husband's name. I have no, I have no issues with that. Um, and my younger sister is hyphenated. Dan and I didn't do it. Hey, one of each. each. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Dan and I didn't do it because I would be Bizzotti hyphen O apostrophe Riley. And Bizzotti O'Reilly. Yeah, Bizzotti O'Reilly has a nice name to it. But could you imagine filling that out on legal forms? Here's a yeah. hyphen and, and, an an apostrophe. and an apostrophe. We just kind of joke that we would break the systems. Yeah. And it would never all fit on, like, documents. Yeah. Um, so he had no – Dan was like, I have no issue with this do whatever you want to do. And I am not offended by this. And then again, I have no judgment of anyone who does take someone else's last name. To me, it was important to yeah, stay Bizzotti. You're making me think about my brother's situation now because he, for all intents and purposes, has immigrated to Japan and he married a Japanese woman and they have a baby. And so the Leo Pennard the fourth, because he had to carry it on, which is silly, um, is now uh, half a baby who's cutest. We just had a FaceTime last night. Oh, yeah. So he's uh, just over a year old, and like he's gonna have this interesting experience as well. He's born in Japan to a Japanese mother, but an immigrant father. So what's his situation gonna be like? He's in daycare now, but um, when he starts going to school and stuff like that. So I've read about that in manga when um like if they're and forgive me, the term in the manga like is like mixed blood, but they take on more of those Aryan or European features and they have like blonde hair and blue eyes. The kids get made fun of in Japan mm -hmm. for that. Well, you would. They don't, they don't awesome. blend in. Yeah, yeah. I have no idea. I'm sure I'm sure he will be fine. Yeah, she'll be fine. I love the idea of FaceTiming children. <laughs> we'll <all> the <laughs> that's a whole other scenario over there. Yeah. We'll just have a new feasting females, bring Margaret in, and we'll talk about what it's like being in a, a, a child to just... The all messed up situations. Yeah. We'll have family court and fam family grievances. <laughs> We're just going to air all our drama. We'll just find a memoir or something to talk about. Yeah. It's interesting to think how it'll be in the future, though, and in a different country. I mean, it's just sort of like the mm -hmm. the other, another experience to discuss. So, yeah. Yay. Yay. Well, this was wonderful. Thank you so much for buddy reading this with me. I know we've like ping ponged all over. We're like, should we talk about it now? Let's save it for later. This was. <laughs> Amazing. I'm so, so glad I got to read this with you. And before we sign off, um, where can people find you? Oh, yes. So I'm mostly on YouTube at 
Margaret Pinard, my channel name. There we go. Doing it backwards. A plus. Nice and job. Also on Twitter as Taste Life Twice, which is my publishing company name where all my books are published. So you can find information on my books there, but also follow all the content that I put out. Amazing. And then for anyone who's new, I'm Kim at Bookmarks and Breadsticks here. You're already here, but I'm also on Instagram at <laughs> Bookmarks here. and Breadsticks. You are here. Are you lost? I don't think so. <laughs> Awesome. Well, enjoy the rest of your long weekend. Thank you again so much for reading with me. And if you ever want to buddy read again, you know how to find me. Yeah. Thank you, Kim. This was great. Thanks Bye, so guys.